I can show you that there's tape across the doors. There's very little activity here, very little movement, very few employees. And there's still no word from officials here on when the airport will reopen, whether they'll go along with the 11 a.m. Uh, uh, timeline. Uh, Delta, which is headquartered here, says later today they will decide when to resume their flights. We can show you some live pictures now of planes on the tarmac. They have been there since Tuesday. Meanwhile, officials here are implementing new security measures mandated by the FAA. I can tell you that on Tuesday, uh, police officers and bomb-sniffing dogs uh, combed every inch, they said every inch of this airport. Additional federal marshals, customs, and border patrol agents assigned to Hartsfield uh, should be arriving today, we're told, uh, as they have been dispatched to major airports across the nation. Uh, this is certainly a major airport. There has been a perennial battle with O'Hare International over the bragging rights to the world's, to the title for world's busiest airport. Now, Atlanta Police Department says they have also permanently assigned additional uh, officers to this airport, although Hartsfield already has a very sophisticated, what they call, multi-layered security system. Most of this was put in place prior to the 96 Olympics held here in Atlanta. Additionally, last year, some very high-tech electronic scanning devices were installed in the concourses. As for stranded passengers, while well, the number is, is undisclosed, some of them were stranded as they were coming through Atlanta, major hub, in the midst of changing planes. Others were stranded uh, when their flights aimed for another destination were stopped here. So those passengers, along with employees, are awaiting word as to when flights will resume here at Hartsfield. I'm Bonnie Anderson, CNN, reporting live from Atlanta. All right, thank you very much, Bonnie. Our continuing coverage, America Under t Attack, will resume in just one moment. This is CNN. This is what the southern part of New York City looks like today. What we can cut capture with this picture, of course, is uh, what this place smells like today. The winds have shifted here, blowing stinging smoke miles away from the crash site at the World Trade Center. The rescue work continues with some grim reminders of what the reality is today. The medical examiner confirming he now has 5,000 body bags in his premises with another 5,000 body bags ordered and on the way, but rescue workers certainly are not giving hope of find, giving up hope of finding more victims trapped in the rubble of the World Trade Center. Good morning, everybody. I'm Paula Zahn reporting for CNN from New York City this morning. And uh, Miles O'Brien will be joining us from Atlanta in a moment. But first, I'm going to check in with Eileen O'Connor, who gave us some fascinating new information just about an hour ago on uh, where the investigation is going now. Uh, Eileen, if you want to recap some of that and tell us uh, anything new you've learned, we'd appreciate that. Well, we have learned that uh, some new information about the Bukhari brothers, but let's first start in Germany, in Hamburg. German police tell CNN they have detained a male airport worker and have brought in a woman for questioning in connection with Tuesday's attack. Now, federal law enforcement in the United States was led to this Hamburg connection by way of information that was gleaned from a car seized at Logan Airport. It was a Mitsubishi, and it was rented by Mohammed Atta, who was, uh, and inside that was a flight uh, manual, an, an Arabic language manual that sources say was very helpful. Also sees um, Atta's driving records indicated that he lived here at uh, 10,001 West Atlantic Boulevard in Coral Springs. Uh, we have some video of that apartment. Uh, sources say that all of this information was very helpful. They also interviewed a man named Charles Voss, who housed Atta and another man, Marwan al Shehi. Charles Voss says that they attended this, uh, let's hear from him. Uh, they, they arrived over there a you know, year ago, it was in last July. And uh, when they first arrived, uh, they had no place to stay. They just popped in pretty much, uh, as I recall, unannounced. And uh, so we provided them uh, for the benefit of, of the flight school. <laughs> 
uh, provided them a place to stay for a few days. So. Now, Huffman, uh, th now these two men uh, attended uh, a flight school, Huffman Aviation International. The director of that school says that FBI took records from the school on these two and other students. He also says that these two students attended the school from July to November of last year, and that after that flight school, they went to another. This shows great planning, Paula. Law enforcement sources say they believe these two men flew one of the two planes from Logan Airport. Remember, their connection was to that car at Logan Airport. The United or the American flight were the ones that flew out of Logan. They flew into the World Trade Center. Both of these men had pilot licenses that we have obtained copies of. The men carried passports from the United Arab Emirates, but officials in that country deny that they are citizens. Now, in addition, there was information gleaned from a car, a rental car, that was impounded in the Portland, Maine airport. This led police to two other brothers. Adnan Bukhari and Amir Bukhari, and also a neighbor. CNN's Susan Candiotti went inside Adnan Bukhari's house. The FBI documents left inside that house indicated, this is Adnan Bukhari, uh, but the, and they, inside that house, those FBI documents indicated that federal authorities took computer credits, car, records, credit card receipts, and other INS documents. Now, also next door to Mr. Bukhari lived another man that police believe could also have been one of the pilots. One of the things that the FBI said that they took was a rooms-to-go receipt. That actually indicated that Bukhari had, in fact, bought some furniture uh, at Rooms to Go on Tuesday. So it may well be, while law enforcement had thought that he might have been one of the men, Adnan Bukhari, who flew the plane out of uh, Logan, uh, coming in from Portland, they now believe that perhaps he is not and is still at large. They will be seeking him, of course, as a material witness. Uh, they did take that uh, receipt from Rooms to Go, and Susan Scandiotti uh, has been in touch. Apparently, the Rooms to Go salesman and got in touch with her, said he has spoken to the FBI, and, uh, and they indicated that perhaps they are already in touch with Mr. Bukhari. Uh, he said that that uh, furniture was supposed to be sent to the uh, port in Fort Lauderdale for shipment back to Saudi Arabia. Paula? All right, Eileen, uh, I, I know that uh, you were busy working your contacts when I was interviewing Attorney General Ashcroft just about a half hour ago, and I asked him a question about a report in Time magazine this morning uh, confirming the fact that uh, at least four terrorist teams, as, and you, you've indicated this too, had a certified pilot with them, and that some of these pilots had flown for an airline in Saudi Arabia. And I asked him if those pilots were training the United States in Saudi Arabia and he, or Saudi Arabia, and he wouldn't answer. That. Explain to us this morning why that is so sensitive. Well, it is sensitive because, of course, they're also in touch with the Saudi government. Now, of course, you know that Osama bin Laden is originally a Saudi national. Um, they would have to be checking what links there are to Saudi Arabia, but also perhaps to Saudi nationals that might be linked to Osama bin Laden. Now, our records also that we've obtained do indicate uh, that the two men. Uh, uh, Adnan and Amir Bukhari, those two brothers that you saw earlier, the pictures of, uh, those two men did indicate uh, that they had a post office box in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and that it was a post office box with Saudi Airlines. They also described themselves to neighbors that we have spoken to as Saudi pilots, and they, we do know that they did receive training here in the United States in Vera Beach at Flight Safety International. FBI have been to Flight Safety International, and they are, of course, looking into them and to others that may have trained there. Also, Paula, they are looking into men connected with uh, these men. They're, they're looking through all of these records. And I am told by a law enforcement source that they are also looking at some other flight schools in Florida. So they believe that there are, of course, other pilots out there that would have flown those uh, two airliners from uh, Dulles and also from Newark. And they may all be connected. Paula? The other piece of information that CNN has gotten uh, that the Attorney General wouldn't comment on is something that you and I talked about in the last hour, which is the possibility that members of each of these hijacking teams may not even have known each other prior to commandeering the jet. I guess part of the motivation for that would be uh, if, if uh, they were to be captured or interrogated, uh, they wouldn't have to betray the whole operation. Any new information on that? Now, my sources are just indicating that they are working increasingly under um, the indication that that is 
likely the case that the pilots may well have known each other. The pi then probably there were two pilots may, uh, for each of those flights may well have known each other, but then they wouldn't have known the other three, and the other three wouldn't necessarily have known the pilots or even each other, but that there all was right. some kind of overt signal they all followed. All right, Eileen, thanks so much for that update. We're going to head back to Atlanta where Miles is standing by. Miles? Paula, a little bit of breaking news coming into us just now. An Amtrak train has, and a freight train have collided just within about 45 minutes, about an hour ago in Utah, in western Utah, in Tuella County. Tuella County uh, Sheriff's Office indicating uh, that the collision occurred and that there were, according to our affiliate there, KSL, two to 300 passengers on board that Amtrak train. Uh, there are reports, according to KSL, that at least uh, one or two of those Amtrak cars is on fire. We are obviously trying to button this up, get some details for you as quickly as they become available. Just to recap, at uh, 7.15 uh, Eastern Time, 5.15 local time, an Amtrak train and a freight train collided in western Utah in Wendover. The county is Tuella County. Uh, the authorities there are responding to the scene there. Two to three hundred passengers on board. Uh, that Amtrak train. Uh, we are working uh, diligently to get details for you as soon as they become available. Send it back to Paula, New York. For guests. All right, we're back here in uh, New York City, and uh, one of the things I think the nation is fascinated by right now is exactly uh, what rescue workers are up against downtown as they try to start to dig through the tons and tons of rubble. Uh, behind my shoulder, of course, you still see smoke coming from that area. Not far from there is uh, Martin Savage, one of our correspondents, who's going to give us an update now on, on exactly what is going on down there. Martin? Good morning to you, Paula. And as you see quite clearly on the Manhattan skyline, it is still that plume of smoke that continues to rise where once the Twin Towers were rising themselves into the sky. It continues to be that sort of grayish, white type cloud. It is fire that is still down there and smoke that is billowing up. The wind has shifted somewhat that has eased the burden on the rescuers down there, but it has made it problematic for other people in lower Manhattan. Uh, people, anyone with respiratory problems in the area are said that uh, they should close their windows and should not come down here. As for the rescuers themselves, we were watching as a fresh load of Rescuers came into the area. They're riding in buses. They're sometimes riding on the backs of trucks. Any mode of transportation that can bring them down the West Highway here to approach to the Twin Towers or what remains of where the Twin Towers once stood. Here is the problem that they're up against. There are at least two buildings in the immediate area around the debris field here that are said to be in imminent danger of potential collapse. We had a partial collapse that took place yesterday afternoon of the seven remaining stories of one of those grand towers. And there is at least two other buildings. One is uh, the Liberty One area, and then there is another building that is known as Building Five. That is a problem, obviously, for the rescuers down there. They had to evacuate quite suddenly, quite quickly. It was almost a, a repeat of some of the scenes we had seen days before. They are carefully working their way through that debris. They're using shovels, they're using picks, they're using heavy earth moving equipment, and at times they're using their bare hands. The daylight now has supplanted the floodlights that bathe the area throughout the nighttime hours. They are searching for life, but many of them know that they are preparing to find death. As you point out, the number of body bags now requested by the city of New York has doubled to about 10,000. They have officially now found 160 bodies, but of course that death toll is going to go way beyond those numbers that have been found. So the desperate work is continuing. They are bringing in more equipment and they are taking out more debris. But they also know that with each passing hour and literally each passing moment, hope of finding more survivors grows dimmer and dimmer. But that hope still exists. Paula? Martin, uh, there was a lot of talk yesterday uh, by FEMA and, and by other organizations across the country talking about sending in these specialized urban uh, rescue teams. Can you give us an idea this morning on exactly how they are adding to the efforts already underway down there? Well, the specialized teams obviously do the heavy lifting in, as far as trying to find those that may still be trapped inside. They are the ones that are dispatched to any indication if there is life to be heard from down underground. They're the ones that have the training, they're the ones that have the equipment and the expertise. The other volunteers that come in are doing also the heavy work, helping to clear the debris so that the specialized teams 
can have access to these specific areas. There are also a lot of firefighters that are down there doing their job, also assisting.